True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The excitement of a new life about to arrive bubbles through the family. The young mother is so close to delivery that she can almost feel her baby in her arms. But as she goes to visit a friend in the last days of her pregnancy, she could have no idea that she will never have that pleasure. Her plans are all about to be destroyed, ripped away, along with the baby growing in her womb. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht. And you're listening to episode 74, The Murder of Valencia Barons. Today's episode is sponsored by absolutely no one. So if you've got a brand whose name you'd like to hear mentioned here, and you'd like to align yourself with some decent storytelling, and more importantly, a victim-focused perspective for the victims of violent crime in South Africa, head over to our website, truecrimesouthafrica.com, and click on the Contact the Show tab. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Kerry ann Renee Erasmus, Zara Robinson, Derek Alberts, Pauline Moneron, and Liz Romalis for your support on Patreon, as well as Ilka Zenskirali and Dane Miller for your support on PayPal. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. Just as a side note, in case you don't know, Pauline Moneron is the host of another amazing South African podcast, Decoding Cults. If you haven't listened to it yet, I highly recommend it. Pauline does an amazing job of covering cults and cult-related issues. Thank you for your support, Pauline. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. There are now additional ways that you can support the show, with two online businesses providing 10% discounts when you use the code TCSA10 at checkout. You can get your health and beauty needs at King Online, and you can get all your printing requirements designed, printed, and delivered by PrintCrowd. There are several new discount codes coming soon, so keep an ear and an eye out for those. You can also help to support me as an individual creator by following my Facebook page, checking out the companion podcast I created with Showmax for the Devil's Dorp documentary, or by purchasing the Krugersdorp Cult Killings audiobook on Audible, Google Play Books, or Apple Books. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to keep the show growing and improving. You can also leave a review on the podcast app you use to listen. If your podcast platform does not have that option, a Google or Facebook review is equally helpful. The case I'm covering today represents one of the rarest types of crimes. I came across this case in Gerard Labuskachny's book, The Profiler Diaries, and in it he mentions that this type of crime is so rare, most profilers and investigators will never come across a case of this nature in their entire careers. During Labuskachny's time in the SAPS, he dealt with three such cases, and today's episode is based on one of them. The crime in question is referred to as caesarean kidnapping, but I think that name really makes it sound a lot less vicious and violent than it actually is. Up front, this episode may be triggering around violence to pregnant women. I know that many listeners cannot listen to episodes in which children are harmed, so I will tell you that the baby in question did not suffer any lasting physical harm during the crime. With that said, There are some pretty graphic descriptions of the injuries inflicted on the victim in this case, so please do be warned about that. In researching this case, I used Gerard Labuskachny's book, The Profiler Diaries, as well as several media articles. So let's get into 
Episode 74, The Murder of Valencia Barons. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. In January 2012, Valencia Behrens was nine months pregnant. She lived in Tukomsras, a small suburb of Randfontein in the Gauteng province of South Africa. Tukomsras is a small, close-knit community made up predominantly of low- to medium-income families. It's one of those communities in which neighbours know each other and often visit and become firm friends. Behrens, like her neighbours, had always felt safe in Tukomsras. Of course, she would take the normal safety precautions that every South African takes, but her children were allowed to play with other neighbourhood children and she never once felt at risk in her home. 34-year-old Valencia was pregnant with her sixth child. She and her long-term partner, Joseph Peterser, had four children together, and Valencia's oldest was from a previous relationship. Valencia and Joseph lived together in Tukomsras, along with their children, his 78-year-old mother, and Joseph's sister, who lived in a cottage on the property. On the morning of the 6th of January, 2012, Valencia was standing in her front yard with her sister-in-law when she was approached by Loretta Cook. Loretta was a resident of Tukomsras, who lived three streets up from Valencia. The woman was a familiar face to Valencia, although she wouldn't have called her a friend. Valencia had heard through the neighbourhood grapevine that Loretta was expecting too. The woman had a bigger build, so her pregnancy was not quite as obvious as Valencia's and she figured she must be in the early stages, unlike Valencia, who felt as though she may go into labour at any moment. Valencia's sister-in-law would later say that Loretta had told Valencia that she had a spare pram at her house, and she should come by and collect it from her. Valencia had been grateful, and left the house soon after. Another neighbour also reported seeing Valencia that morning, He stopped to wish her a happy new year and inquire about the impending delivery of her baby. She told him that she was due any day and was just on the way to Loretta's house in Venus Street to collect a pram the woman had promised her. Meanwhile, at the house in Venus Street, Loretta Cook was sitting with her feet up on the couch on the phone to her boyfriend. She'd met the man in 2009 and had been living with him until recently when she'd gone on maternity leave from her job and moved in with her mother to prepare for the delivery of her baby. She told her boyfriend that she was having very bad back pain and she was waiting for her mother to get back home so that they could go to the clinic. Loretta's boyfriend and family were as excited for the birth of the child she was carrying as Valencia's family was, of course. Shortly before she went on maternity leave from her job, her employer had thrown a baby shower for her. Loretta had posted photographs of the party on social media and all the goodies she'd received. She was quite a prolific Facebook poster during her pregnancy, often complaining of how swollen her feet were and wishing that her baby would just arrive so she could be rid of all the discomfort. Valencia's home was just 300 metres from Loretta's, so it didn't take long for her to get there. When she arrived, Loretta greeted her and invited her inside. She then called Leratu, a young girl who lived on their property, and asked her to go to the shop and buy a loaf of bread. Leratu would later say that she'd seen a lady she didn't know. She would later confirm from photographs that the woman was Valencia Behrens, sitting in the lounge. Loretta took the money from Loretta and headed off to the shop. Almost as soon as the young girl left the property, a scene of horror began to unfold. When she returned with the loaf of bread, she noticed that the front gate was locked. She called out for some time, and when Loretta did not respond, she jumped over the gate. Heading to the house to deliver the bread, 
Loratu entered the courtyard area, and it was there that she found Valencia Behrens laying on the ground, motionless. The young girl was just 11 years old, and she was terrified. She had no idea what was going on, and dropped the loaf of bread next to Valencia, fleeing to her outside room where she hid. Loretta's mother had gone to home affairs that day, and around noon she received a phone call from her daughter. Loretta was out of breath, and asked her mother to return home as soon as possible. She put the phone down before her mother could ask what was going on. Concerned for her daughter's safety, Loretta's mother telephoned her sister-in-law, who was closer, and asked her to go and check in on Loretta. When the sister-in-law arrived at the property, though, she found the gate locked too, and when calling out to Loretta didn't rouse any response, she phoned Loretta's mother back and told her she couldn't get in. By then, Loretta's mother had abandoned the queue at Home Affairs and, along with her son, who'd accompanied her, gotten into a taxi to head home. She arrived at the house soon after and unlocked the gate. All three entered the property. They would never mention anything about seeing Valencia laying in the courtyard. Rather, they said they entered the property, they went inside the house, and they hadn't been able to find Loretta anywhere. Loretta's mother started to panic when she saw a streak of blood leading out the kitchen. Then her son called her from the passageway. He had found a baby. The child was covered in blood and making small, whimpering sounds, but it was alive. They bundled the baby in a towel. Laying near the baby was a bloody razor blade. Then Loretta's mother and her sister-in-law flagged down a taxi and headed off to the clinic with the baby. They still had no idea where Loretta was, nor why she would have left what they thought was her baby laying in the passage. But the first port of call was to get the child medical care, and then they hoped they could figure out where Loretta was. At the clinic, Loretta's mother waited while nurses assessed the baby. Then she received a telephone call. Loretta had been found. She was in a back room of the property. She wanted her mother to know that the baby was not hers. The now wholly confused mother left her contact details and the baby at the clinic and rushed back home to figure out what was going on with her daughter. Loretta's brother relayed that he'd found his sister seemingly unconscious in the back room. She had blood on the bottom of her dress. Surprisingly, The room she was in was locked from the inside, so her brother had to break the door down with an axe to get her out. Loretta said she had no idea what had happened in the last few hours. She didn't remember how she'd gotten into the room, nor anything about a baby, or why she had blood on her, but she knew that the child was not hers. As they began to walk around the property, Loretta's mother stumbled upon the body of Valencia Behrens. The woman was lying in the courtyard, just where Lorato had seen her. Beside her body was a municipal dustbin, tipped over on its side. Valencia's head and upper body were partially inside the dustbin. She was completely clothed, and her feet were bound together. The police were immediately called, and this is where it all starts to get a bit weird, as though it wasn't strange enough already. When police arrived on the scene, they were told that a woman had died after giving birth at the house, and this version was apparently accepted off the bat. In Gerard Labaskakny's book, he points out how dangerous it is for a detective to simply accept the provided story when arriving on a scene and not conduct any critical thinking of their own anyone looking at the scene, should have immediately questioned the story, but they didn't. Thankfully, there would be a few individuals in this case who would question the provided versions, and eventually help to reveal the truth. One such person was an off-duty policeman who lived a few houses down from Loretta's house. Constable Siakel was actually not on duty on the day that Valencia Behrens lost her life. 
He was quite happily relaxing on his couch with his feet up when his wife ran in and said that the cook's house was completely surrounded by people and there were police cars and an ambulance there. Seichel immediately got dressed and headed out to see what was happening. His colleagues recognised him and welcomed him in. Paramedics had just officially declared Valen Chabarin's dead, but strangely, no one could actually give Seichel a proper explanation about what happened. This alone made him suspicious. The story that had begun to be pieced together was that Valencia had arrived at the house to collect the pram and gone into labour, although Loretta said she didn't really remember. She assumed she may have helped her to deliver the baby, but then everything went blank. Seichel found it very odd that a woman who had just delivered a baby would still be wearing her pants, and also that her feet would be tied. The broken-down door at the back of the property the razor blade covered in blood, none of it made sense to him. Plus, why was Valencia half inside a dustbin? If she had delivered in the house and then tried to crawl to find help, would she not be at the locked gate and not in the courtyard in a dustbin? Loretta's mother also mentioned to Seichel that the baby had a cut on its head. These points all began to click together in Seichel's mind, but he wasn't on duty, and he had no mandate over the scene. A senior inspector had just arrived, and he was sure that his colleague would have everything in hand. The officers that were in charge of the scene, though, unfortunately had no immediate suspicions. Despite large pools of blood laying at various places around the property, and what clearly looked like drag marks in blood, police allowed several members of the public onto the property to support the family, and maddeningly even allowed them to start cleaning up. By this time, Joseph Peterser had been called to the scene. Initially, he was told that Valencia had fallen down. When he arrived at Loretta's house, he realised that the mother of his children was in fact dead. Labas Kachni describes in his book how Peterser had sat with Valencia's body, holding an umbrella over her to shade her from the sun until her body was removed from the premises. At this point in his grief, Peterser believed that both Valencia and the baby had died. After Valencia was taken away, he walked into the kitchen of the house to ask for a glass of water, and Loretta's mother saw him. It was then that she told the stunned man that his baby was at the clinic. Pitzeser rushed to the clinic where he found his newborn baby girl still wrapped in the towel she'd been brought in with. Besides the small cut on her head, the nurses said she was in good health, but it would be better for him to take the child to the local hospital for her to be checked over by a paediatrician. In yet another strange twist of fate, The ambulance that was called to take Peterser and his baby girl to the hospital first made another stop. Loretta's mother, concerned about her daughter after all the chaos of the day, had phoned an ambulance to take her to the hospital for a checkup. The very same ambulance that collected Loretta and her mother also stopped at the clinic to collect Peterser and the baby. One of the paramedics that collected Loretta that day had entered the property. He'd gone inside the room where Loretta had originally been found and noticed a piece of belt hanging from the exposed beams of the ceiling. There was a small chest standing on the floor, directly underneath the belt. When he asked Loretta's brother what that was about, he told the medic that his sister had wanted to commit suicide. When all four arrived at the hospital and were waiting to be seen, Peterser, who was now a little less dazed, asked Loretta what had happened at her house. The woman said that Valencia had arrived and she'd poured her some juice. They sat chatting for a little while and then Loretta said she'd gone out to bring the dustbin in from the street and to check if her car was locked. Loretta said that when she went back inside, she just remembered seeing a lot of blood around Valencia and then she'd passed out. That, she claimed, was all she remembered. 
Although every aspect of this case is horrifying, what happened on the day after Valencia's death really struck me when I read it. Feel free to form your own opinion about what happened, but I just found it so absolutely callous. The day after, the mother of his children was found dead while he was trying to care for a newborn baby, Joseph Peterser received a telephone call from Loretta's mother. The woman told him that he needed to come by and help them scrub Valencia's blood off the paving. It was staining the floor. When Peterser dutifully arrived to scrub his loved one's blood off the paving at the cookhouse, he was informed that Valencia had inexplicably thrown her own shoes in the dustbin, and if he wanted them, he could dig them out. As I said, feel free to form your own opinion about this, but the words kicking someone when they're down definitely entered my mind. When Valencia's body was removed from the scene, she was taken to the Ruedeport mortuary. It would be here that the second hero in the story would emerge. Dr. Gina Rowe would conduct the autopsy on Valencia Behrens on the 9th of January, three days after she'd been declared dead at Loretta's home. To go along with the body, she'd had only an intake document, which noted that the deceased had died after giving birth and nothing else. Ideally, the detective on the case, or at the very least a crime scene expert, should have attended the autopsy for evidence collection purposes and to take photographs. In his book, though, Gerard Labaskachny notes that at Johannesburg Mortuary, which is the busiest in our country, less than 2% of autopsies are attended by anyone from the SAPS. This clearly, and also according to Labaskachny, is hugely problematic. And if the forensic pathologist is not as aware as Roe was, or if they're simply very busy that day, very important information can slip through the cracks. Thankfully, this would not be the case with Valencia's autopsy. The first alarming thing that Dr. Roe noticed, of course, was that the woman's legs were bound. Then, when Valencia's clothes were removed, the most alarming thing of all was revealed. Dr. Rowe found a 26-centimetre incision across Valencia's lower abdomen. Sure she had read the report wrong, she looked again. But no, it definitely said that the patient had passed away after a natural birth had gone wrong. So why did this woman appear to have had a caesarean? Other injuries on Valencia's body only further clouded the picture. On her upper arm, the doctor found a 12-centimetre laceration, and her eyes were hemorrhaged. When Dr. Rowe looked inside of Valencia's abdomen, she found a black plastic bag crumpled up inside of her. Also, Dr. Rowe discovered that Valencia's entire uterus was missing. The doctor was now seriously concerned that Valencia's death was not being investigated as a murder. So instead of simply writing up her report and leaving it for collection, as would be ordinary procedure, she went out of her way to find out who the investigator on this case was. Please note, she did not even have a case number, and she personally phoned the detective in charge, telling the man that there was no way that Valencia Behrens had died from birth complications and that he had a murder on his hands. With this news, the detectives went back to the crime scene, which by this time had been completely cleaned. Eight photographs from the scene were in the docket. Six of them were of Valencia's body. One was of her bound feet, and another was of her face which meant that zero photos had been taken of any other physical evidence. The razor blade, the broken down door, the noose, the multiple pools of blood. None of it. If there was ever an appropriate place to say this, it blows my mind. 
the detectives sat down with Loretta and her family and explained that the evidence they were now finding was not matching up with the original story. Loretta then offered the following explanation. For the most part, she told the policeman the same story she told Joseph Peterson, except this time she said that when she brought the dustbin back inside, she'd found Valencia laying bleeding in the spot where her body had been found. She said she'd run inside to fetch a towel to stem the bleeding, but couldn't remember anything after that. Then, Loretta's mother decided to add that Valencia had in fact arrived at the house with a plastic rubbish bag and a razor blade. The detective asked how the woman could possibly know that if she'd been at home affairs when everything had happened. The woman had no explanation. Instead, she got up and walked out of the room. She returned with the razor blade that she said she'd found next to the baby. DNA on this blade would later be matched back to Valencia Barron's. She also then handed a larger pack of razor blades to the detectives. She explained she'd used one of them to cut Loretta's clothes off her when they'd found her unconscious in the back room. They were all the same brand. Loretta's mother asked the detectives to go easy on her daughter because she was advanced in her own pregnancy and she was concerned for her welfare. The detective looked at Loretta and asked her if she had any proof that she was pregnant. The interview was ended soon after this. And it's at this point that the dark undercurrents of this case really starts to expose itself. Because as you may well have guessed, Loretta Cook was not pregnant. She had never been pregnant. Instead, for months, she'd faked her pregnancy, even had a baby shower at work, complained about how uncomfortable she was on social media, and led her boyfriend to believe that he was going to be a father. It was all a lie. The day after the detectives visited Loretta Cook, she retained defence counsel. Her lawyer informed the police that she was in fact not pregnant, and she was arrested. During the investigation, a municipal worker who was responsible for emptying dustbins in Venus Street came forward. He told police that on the day in question, he had been at Loretta's house just past noon, and he'd attempted to empty her dustbin. He had found it too heavy for the truck's mechanical lifter to raise, though. And so, without looking inside, they'd left it on the sidewalk. It is very likely that the dustbin was too heavy to lift because the body of Valencia Behrens was inside it. Concerned that Loretta may attempt to use a mental health claim as a defence, perhaps by saying she'd been experiencing a phantom pregnancy and the murder had occurred as a result of this, police went to great lengths to prove that Loretta had not, at any point, thought that she was pregnant. This was proven when a nurse at the clinic reported that Loretta herself had told her that she'd recently menstruated and she had acknowledged a negative urine test for pregnancy. Everyone around Loretta was shocked and dismayed that they'd been lied to. Her employer, who'd thrown her a baby shower and promised her full pay while she was on her fake maternity leave, handed over a note to police, which Loretta had given them. On the surface, it appeared to be a doctor's note confirming her pregnancy. When police analysed the computer that Loretta had access to at work, though, they found evidence that she had created the note herself. The letter had been created in May 2011, a full eight months before the murder of Valencia Behrens. As was necessary in a case of this nature, Loretta underwent a 30-day psychiatric observation at Stagfontein Psychiatric Hospital. At the end of this period of observation, she was found fully competent and fit to stand trial. Now at this point, you may be wondering what role the investigative psychology unit played in this case. That happened almost a month after Loretta had been arrested. The investigating officer visited the IPU's office and gave the team an overview of the case. 
Essentially, the role they would play would be as expert witnesses at trial. Loretta's trial would experience delay after delay, until eventually in November 2013, the IPU was advised that the case had been transferred to the High Court for prosecution. At this point, Gerard Labaskachny went out to interview Loretta's employer and some of her colleagues. Several important pieces of information came out of this interview, which pointed to Loretta's very clear planning and quite a cunning and cold premeditation. The woman had seemingly played the pregnant woman role to a T, even asking if she could stay at home when a colleague had contracted German measles because she was afraid for her baby's safety. Interestingly, she told her colleagues quite early on that she was having a girl, and as a result, all of her baby shower gifts were pink. Valencia Behrens, of course, had been carrying a girl. And then a photograph was produced that sent chills down investigators' spines. At her baby shower, Loretta Cook had been presented with a very nice pram. Was this the pram that had lured Valencia to Loretta's home on that day? After more delays, in June 2014, Labaskachny was asked to prepare a report for the trial. Loretta's boyfriend had been completely devastated when his girlfriend had been arrested and the extent of her lies had been revealed, and he had all but disappeared. During the trial, Loretta's defence attorney had a psychologist testify on her behalf. The psychologist did not address any of the actual elements of the crime, but did attempt to claim that Loretta's amnesia around the event pointed to a possible psychotic episode. The defence psychologist wholly accepted Loretta's version of events without having seen any of the evidence. Even more interestingly, or perhaps shockingly, the version that the psychologist presented as Loretta's did not match up with the statement she gave police. To the psychologist, she went back to saying that she'd found Valencia inside the house, bleeding, and added that it had taken her 45 minutes to bring the dustbin inside the property. To their credit, the defence psychologist did testify that Loretta did not appear to have any remorse around the incident. In his book, Labaskachny points out that in caesarean kidnapping cases, there are very often facets of personality disorders present, but actual psychotic symptoms, which may indeed impact culpability, are usually not present. In other words, the motivation for their crimes comes from themselves and their own desires, not from an uncontrollable mental illness which results in the loss of the ability to differentiate right from wrong. Loretta had meticulously planned the pregnancy, and it seemed very likely that Valencia had been her target from the start. On the 26th of September 2014, Loretta Cook was found guilty of premeditated murder and on one count of, of exposure of a young child. She was handed down a life sentence. What really happened in the home of Loretta Cook that day will never really be known, unless Loretta one day decides to admit her guilt. But it seems very likely to me, at least, that the crime played out as follows. For months, Loretta Cook had faked a pregnancy. The motive was likely to cement her relationship with her boyfriend. Perhaps she'd been unable to conceive herself. At some point, she identified her neighbour living just three streets away as a good target. Loretta may very well have selected that specific day to kill Valencia for various reasons. Firstly, the house would be empty. Her mother and brother were going to home affairs. And the municipal rubbish truck was coming around that day. While that may have been a coincidence... It does seem like this was Loretta's plan to dispose of Valencia's body, because it seems to be the very fact that the body was not removed as she'd expected that had set everything else off track. Clearly, the entire point of this had been to get Valencia's baby. That would have only been possible, though, if Valencia had disappeared. When things went wrong, 
and Loretta found herself with a dead body and a baby, she would have realized that it was impossible for her to go ahead with her plan. She could not claim that the baby was hers because a woman who had previously been very heavily pregnant was now dead on her property. So she quickly changed up the plan. Briefly, she may have considered suicide and then soon decided against it. Instead, she locked herself in the back room and pretended to be unconscious. There was no proof that Valencia had been drugged, although it is entirely possible that Loretta had slipped something into the juice she gave her. But she clearly fought back when she was attacked. The cut on her arm and the petechial hemorrhaging in her eyes proved that. The latter could point to strangulation, but it's very difficult to say whether this may have happened before or after the baby was removed from her body. I would like to hope that Valencia Behrens was unconscious when Loretta Cook took a razor blade to her abdomen. But the cut on her arm tells us that she was awake and fighting back at some point. In case you're wondering about the whereabouts of Valencia's uterus, it was actually handed in at a hospital. It is unknown who handed it in or where it was found. It was believed to have been a paramedic, but it was eventually traced back to this horrific case and DNA matched to Valencia. Now, I cover some pretty graphic and horrific crimes on this podcast, but I have to admit that this one is definitely high up on the list. I don't actually know how many other perpetrators I've spoken about that are quite as cold as Loretta Cook. Put aside the planning and deliberation for almost a year before she committed the crime. This woman took a razor blade, and forgive me, but she sliced open a pregnant woman's abdomen, removed her entire uterus and her baby. Then, when she realized she wasn't going to be able to get away with her plan, she left the baby, who'd just been born, who she had just gone through all of this to get. Laying on the cold tiles of her home, she just dumped the child there, because she was no longer useful to her. And that, in my opinion, is what it boiled down to. When Loretta took that razor blade to Valencia's abdomen, she wasn't cutting into a human being to retrieve another human being. She was using the object in front of her, as she pleased, to get what she wanted. And the baby was just another object. So when its usefulness was diminished, she disposed of it. That it is now a little girl called Hope. She is being raised by her grandmother and father. She still bears the scar from that razor blade on the side of her face. And her family and siblings still bear the scars of Valencia's loss on their hearts and lives. On the 6th of January 2012, Valencia Behrens was filled with the promise of new life. Her family was about to grow by one, and she'd been offered a pram by a kind neighbour. Even in her worst nightmares, she could not have even imagined what lay in wait for her at Loretta Cook's home. I find it very hard to think about the horror that must have represented this young mother's last minutes. And honestly... I don't even think if Loretta Cook spends every single minute of her life behind bars, there will ever be justice for what she did. Perhaps the one silver lining in all of this is that little hope gets to be just that. She gets to live on and be part of Valencia's legacy. Just as Loretta's actions represent everything that is wrong with human behavior, Little Hope is a living, breathing representation of everything that is good. Valencia Behrens, 
rest gently. And little hope, may you grow and live and love just as your mother would have wanted. Thank you for listening to episode 74, The Murder of Valencia Barons. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the app you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'll be back next Friday with another episode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon. 